What's interesting about cannabis beverages is we're talking about that within the confines of cannabis, but when we talk about the future of beverages more holistically and the share of buzz, we, we recognize very directly that we're seeing that shift from alcohol into a cannabis infused or alternatively infused beverage. So very exciting for the future prospect. Clearly there are some growth uh, trends that we need to uh, accelerate in the market. And, and we're doing that with a lot of the panelists and companies that are, that are joining us this afternoon. So um, thank you again, Cooper, for uh, that detailed information. A um, couple different housekeeping things. We're going to be running some polls throughout, so you'll, you'll see some polls jumping up on screen. Please answer those. Uh, we will integrate them as we possibly can. And I would also like to thank one of our upcoming panelists and sponsor, Goodwin Law. And so without further ado, we'll jump right into the policy and regulation panel. And I will let our panelists introduce themselves, but we have Tracy Mason from House of Saka, who is also a Cannabis uh, Beverage Association board member, uh, Brett Schumann from Goodwin, and Austin Stevenson from Vertosa, also a, a CBA board member. So thank you all for joining. And we will give everyone a second just to answer that poll and take it off of their screen. Uh, so Austin and Tracy, it looks like you are still both muted. And before we jump in, why don't I let you all introduce yourself? So Tracy, I'll let you jump in first. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Tracy Mason. I am the co-founder and CEO of House of Saka. We make and manufacture the first and only cannabis infused wines from Napa Valley. Um, so we've really carved out a niche for ourselves in the luxury space targeting the emerging female consumer, which as you saw from the data that Cooper just gratefully shared for us uh, is the biggest consumer in um, infused beverages. So we're really excited to be here and talk to you about our journey as a company. Great, thank you. Uh, Brett? Yeah, thanks Evan, and thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm a partner at Goodwin Proctor uh, based in San Francisco. We're an international law firm. I started our firm's cannabis law practice in late 2015. I co-lead the practice now. Uh, we represent clients uh, throughout the ecosystem. Um, the deal we just heard about earlier, Jim, uh, our client is Dutchie and actually Greenbits and uh, Leaf Logics were also our clients. So we lost two clients yesterday when Dutchie rolled up Leaf Logics and, uh, and Greenbits. Um, also have clients in the beverages space. Really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you. And Austin. Cool. Hey, thanks, Evan. Uh, and, and thanks to the entire Can and Gather community for, for having us here. Uh, my name is Austin Stevenson. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer uh, here at Vertosa, uh, where we deliver the world's most trusted uh, cannabis ingredients. Um, we don't cultivate, we don't extract. Instead, we focus on one thing and one thing only, and it's being the best delivery mechanism uh, for cannabinoids. Uh, we use uh, advanced uh, emulsification technology turn cannabis oils into water dispersible ingredients. Uh, and we've had the great privilege of being able to infuse many of the top brands um, that Headset had uh, discussed in the prior, um, prior slide deck, uh, as well as many more, um, both here in California and Canada, um, Midwestern states, and, and also soon a few East, East Coast states as well. Um, so grateful to be here. Uh, we also serve uh, on the Cannabis Beverage Association um, where we are taking a, a leading role in helping to create a more sustainable, uh, more equitable, uh, and really easier to navigate uh, supply chain for ca cannabis beverage manufacturers. Um, so excited to be here and, and thankful uh, for putting this panel together, Evan. Great. Thank you, Austin. So let's jump in. We're going to do a little bit of a softball here, I hope, uh, which is really around uh, the legal framework and the regulatory framework nationally. And then we'll get into some uh, geographically specific uh, regulatory challenges that we all see within the cannabis supply chain. Um, but, but just to kick it off, Brett, where are we on the, the general landscape with the cannabis industry uh, at the federal level and more specifically any legislation that we're seeing uh, currently on the docket that will help move this industry forward? Yeah, thanks, Evan. So um, obviously, we all know we now have uh, Democratic administration, Democratic Senate, Democratic House. 
And I think there's a lot of hope and optimism that we'll see legalization or at least decriminalization uh, coming out in the next couple of years at the federal level. Um, you know, I don't want to be the Debbie Downer of the panel, uh, and I'm also not a, a political prognosticator, but I'm not all that optimistic um, that we're going to see that much progress. Uh, most people probably know Joe Biden is not a big fan of legalization. He never has been. Uh, he got pulled to the left a little bit during the campaign to win over some birdie supporters and for other reasons, but he's never really gone much further than uh, rescheduling uh, uh, marijuana to schedule two. And, you know, Vice President Harris's position is a little ambiguous. We all know she was a co-sponsor of the MORE Act when she was a senator, but now that she's working with President Biden, there have been some signals that her position has changed. So, uh, there's, there's, it's not the most enthusiastic uh, administration in the White House. Um, we, we do though have some enthusiasm in Congress. Uh, we do have already introduced in the House a bill uh, by a representative from Florida to move marijuana from Schedule One to Schedule Three. That might, that's a bigger deal than it might sound because moving it to Schedule Three would solve the 280E problem that I'm sure so many of our audience members are familiar with and struggle with. Um, and then, of course, the news has come out that the Senators Wyden, Schumer, and Booker uh, plan to introduce a more comprehensive uh, legalization proposal. Uh, that hasn't come out yet. I think they said in February it would be put, you know, put together soon. I think COVID and other things have, have slowed that down. It will likely look more like the MORE Act. I think the interesting thing to watch is, you know, whether they moderate what they're going to do based on the signals coming from the Biden administration. I think the last thing that's worth mentioning here is um, Senator Brown, uh, the new head of the Senate Banking Committee. I think all of us are, are looking forward to some banking reform, maybe the State Banking Act. Uh, in February, uh, Senator Brown said that that's got to be linked to uh, some social justice reform. Obviously, uh, social justice reform is important. I think as a practical matter, uh, linking those two will slow down the uh, passage of the Safe Banking Act. So I think that's a high level summary of where things stand right now in Washington. Great. Well, as much as it may not be as optimistic as we all like, from your perspective, I do think there is a lot of optimism seeing what has transpired over what has been a, a relatively unfortunate circumstance of the past year, but also one for our industry that has helped to catapult us into national spotlight being deemed essential in most major markets where we are currently legal. And that then drives the further split between state and federal regulations. Um, with that said, I know, uh, Tracy, both you and Austin sit in California. California generally uh, provides a lot of direction for the way that federal regulations go, given the size of the market. And you've been operating in one of the more difficult uh, regulatory schemes uh, that we have in, in the country. Can maybe, uh, Tracy, if, if you can a little bit, um, you, you've been iterating with your brand now for a while, and, and you can share some of the unique challenges that we have, not just in California, but I think California is a proxy for um, infused beverages. What, what are some of the things you're seeing in the regulatory landscape and the challenges that it's causing you uh, to bring your brand to market and how you're overcoming that? Well, I, gosh, there's so much meat on that bone to talk about, but I think um, where I would start would be that I, you know, when, when cannabis regulations were drawn up, they were done so under the guise of edibles um, and under the guise of pre-rolls and, and, and flour. The notion of a cannabis-infused beverage was really not on the minds of our assembly when they were crafting these, when they were crafting these bills. So what they were doing is they were looking at, um, at edibles and, and a kind of shoving at beverages into the edibles category. Um, well, when you look at the uh, when you look at the regulations surrounding edibles, they make quite a lot of sense, and they follow um, the way in which other um, what vice like industries have to follow, whether that's you know tobacco or alcohol. And having been thirty years in, in alcohol, I've, I've been used to out operating in a highly regulated environment. But my God, <laughs> so so when you're trying to force fit a category into another one, um, what happens is a lot of those. There's a tremendous amount of inconsistency that, that comes with that. So specific to beverage, for example, um, beverages have to be packed in an opaque package, which makes a lot of sense if you're selling gummies or you're selling 
um, chocolates or, or other things that could, would be highly attractive to children, you know, whether they would get into that and, you know, go after chocolates. Gosh, my friends do that. Um, but, you know, when you're talking about a beverage, our beverages, you know, I don't know if you can see it, but I mean, it is a very sophisticated product designed for a very sophisticated consumer. It's not meant to attract children. So having to go through the process of making a beautiful wine bottle opaque to having to buy and then having to label on top of that um, is absurd, especially when there's inconsistencies that a amber call, an amber color bottle, for example, is considered opaque. Why a green bottle or a blue bottle or any other bottle wouldn't be it is it makes no sense to us. In addition, following along the lines of, of um, edible. So, you know, we have 40 milligrams of, of THC and five milligrams of CBD in our sock of pink. You know, that's far less than any edible package. Um, but yet we have to have childproof and uh, resealable uh, closures on our product. Um, again, to control the dosage, but you can still buy a single serve 100 milligram product um, without those same constraints. So it's, it's a, there's a lot of inconsistencies that we're really working through with uh, the legislator, with the Cannabis Beverage Association here in California to alleviate some of those um, barriers that we've hit that, that also cause a tremendous amount of pain to the end consumer. Cause we have to, you know, if this was a regular bottle of Napa Rosé, the label, the bottle, the cork, the closure, would probably cost about 250 a bottle, but because of all we have to do to get this legal, just the bottle, just without the wine, without everything else, is uh, is about five dollars a bottle. So all of that, at the end of the day, hits the end consumer, and I think prevents them from indulging in what is the safest, most consistent, consistent and predictable um, form of of cannabis consumption. And certainly, will be the wave of the future if we go any way, the way that the world has gone. If you look at any any uh, any convenience store, you know, the, of the vast percentage of their shelves are, de are dedicated to pa uh, packaged beverage. This will be how people take cannabis, especially after COVID. It's a great social way of enjoying cannabis without having to, without having to pass a joint around. Um, so there's a lot of that, but I do know that the intention behind it was good, right? Most things are, but, and that's why we're working so hard to sort of point out these inconsistencies and to self-police and, and bring beverages forward in a way that our, our legislators can understand them because they frankly don't. We've learned, I think anyone like Austin and I share are on the same panel, I mean, on the same board, we know that they don't really know anything about them. So it's our job to educate. It's our job to self-police and, um, and, and I think that will be what will happen, have to happen moving forward as, as we gain more and more traction toward federal legalization. Although I do see that being a long time out. Yeah, I really, really appreciate those thoughts. And, and you, you've hit upon a lot of the challenges, but really those two are the opportunities that we have as uh, beverage operators and, and category leaders, which is to try to address those challenges in a way that better suits the end consumer and, and doing so in a way that does still support the regulators and, and their concerns, be it that many of the concerns just, just follow the antiquated stigmas around cannabis and its potential harm. But, but again, those are things that in a highly regulated industry and you came out of alcohol, we will have to uh, adapt to very well and, and make sure that we have the same um, sense of control with cannabis beverages too. So, so thank you for sharing all that. Um, and, and you brought up a couple of points there and, and Austin, maybe you can touch upon it as well. So packaging clearly is a challenge to, to double the cost of packaging to get a product to a consumer is a significant hit. Um, but there are some other nuances within the regulatory frameworks that we see specifically around potency and testing. And, and Tracy brought up consistency and beverage clearly is a very uh, natural social consumption mechanism. Um, how do we get around the issues of testing and potency and what are the things that, that you and the CBA and also uh, Vertosa does to help uh, cannabis beverage operators bring a consistent product to market and educate regulators on some of the challenges around that? Yeah, um, I mean, you bring up a, a very critical aspect uh, to the supply chain and it, it is quality testing. Um, you know, in any food and, and beverage supply chain, uh, QC, QA is critical. 
um, especially here in America where consumers are used to going to a convenience store, picking up uh, a, a package good and, and trusting uh, what's on the label uh, is in that product. Um, historically, cannabis has had a very, very hard time uh, with accurate testing, um, not only of cannabis beverages, but also to for more of the um, you know, standard products like flour uh, and extracts and, and oils. Um, and the real reason for, for that challenge uh, is lack of standardization uh, and testing methods. Um, before Bertosa, uh, I led a third-party analytical chemistry laboratory at Eurofin Scientific. Um, it's one of the, the world's largest analytical chemistry laboratories, a uh, multi-billion dollar company where we specialize in food, beverage, um, uh, agriculture, uh, and pharma. Um, in all other traditional industries, uh, all standards and, and methods are, are peer reviewed. Uh, and the cannabis space, because it's a nascent and you know, developing industry, a lot of the cannabis testing providers at current are cannabis businesses first and then testing providers second. And for, for many of them, to the frustration of a lot of operators, they're holding those standards and methods as, as, as proprietary or, or trade secrets. Um, and it's, it's quite, quite frankly, it's, it's a, to the harm of the industry as a whole uh, because science inherently is supposed to be peer reviewed. Um, and um, when you go to, what ends up happening is that when you go to one testing lab who is using, let's call it method A um, for a cannabis beverage, and you go to a second testing lab, which is using method B, and then you go to a third testing lab, which is using method C, you're going to get three completely different results. And then that just confuses everybody. It confuses the co-manufacturer, it confuses the brand. And they say, well, which one do I trust? Which one do I you know, do all of my packaging and labeling in accordance to? Which one is this distributor going, going to use? Um, and it just creates a, a situation where no one's really held accountable and no one really has trust in the supply chain uh, because of inconsistency uh, around manufacturing. Um, and uh, it is, it is the, the pain of our existence right now, but also the opportunity that we have um, to come together and to collaborate as a supply chain uh, to hold testing labs accountable. Um, and so what we've done at, this, at the Cannabis Beverage Association, which is a consortium of different cannabis brands uh, supply chain manufacturers, um, uh, co-manufacturers, distributors, and the likes thereof coming together and saying, hey, we're going to use our membership fees and dues to invest in the, the industry and to invest in third-party audits uh, of testing laboratories. What we want to discover uh, is where there's commonality and where there's differences. Uh, and in third-party testing, it really comes down to, to two primary things. Um, plus one, which is a third, which is standards, methods, and people. Um, and, you know, we want to know at an analytical level and quantifiable level is when you're taking a sample and you're sending it to a testing lab, you use what they call our standards. Standards are essentially the benchmark or the baseline uh, for quantitative analysis. Um, so when you're trying to measure how much THC is in a product, you have a THC standard. Uh, well, these standards are something that's manufactured. And one lab may use standards from manufacturer X, another lab may use standards from manufacturer Y, third lab may use standards from manufacturer Z. Well, reality is that in traditional food and ag and pharma, the government says what standards to use. That's not the case in cannabis. Um, so we're trying to, number one, learn, is there consistent standards using at most of the labs? And then use po our policy agenda to help influence legislation saying, hey, here's the most common standards. Here's our recommendation as a Cannabis Beverage Association. Let's uh, revise some of the language in our testing protocols to get consistent standards. So everyone is using the same benchmark. Uh, the second level is methods. Um, how are you testing? Are you using liquid chromatography? Are you using gas chromatography? Are you using another method uh, to test this cannabis beverage? Um, cannabis beverage is challenging to test. It's not like testing flour. You have to prep the sample differently. If you have carbonation in the, in the product, you have, to, you have to remove some of the carbonation so there's not interference. You have to look for other ingredients that may be interfering. Um, so all of those challenges kind of are baked into wanting to find a consistent method. Um, so we can do that and be able to, again, use 
our trade association to help to develop consistent methods and hold testing labs who are using the same method to testing cannabis beverages, then we're going to get, again, more consistency. Again, standards, methods, and then people. Uh, it's just quality of people. Something that California's done a great job with is holding a lot of testing labs to a high standard in terms of accreditations, ASO accreditations, for example. Um, this also then develops into how and what type of people you recruit to be able to work at those accredited laboratories. Um, but ensuring that they're doing the best practices to hold themselves accountable to using the right standards, the right methods, and then being open to share and have those peer reviews across different, different laboratories and against you know, different analytical chemistry associations. Um, that's, that's the biggest piece that, that needs to change. The people have got to be willing to work together at the laboratory level and in cannabis. We, has to, we have to adopt that peer review mentality that you see in pharma, that you see in agriculture where testing laboratories are talking to each other and getting consistent um, on the standards and the methods that they use. Um, and so we're helping to do that with the Cannabis Beverage Association. Luckily, we've gotten such great positive responses from a few couple handfuls of testing labs here in California uh, and hope to be able to spread this thing uh, across the nation as well. That's great. Yeah, and, and really appreciate all the work that, that you and Tracy and the CBA does and, and everyone else in the cannabis space that is advocating for, uh, you know, good regulations of beverages and, and taking the good from other industries and, and trying to uh, eliminate some of the uh, burdensome process that we may not need in the cannabis space. So that, that's really helpful. Um, maybe let's think uh, a little bit further along in the evolution of a brand and, and still related to regulations. One of the challenges that I know any brand faces is expansion. And, um, you know, we, we just saw this, this past week, some news coming out of Mexico so, so maybe, Brett, can you talk about cross-border transactions? And when I mean cross-border, I also mean state-to-state -state in the U.S. because we, we do have borders that geographically divide where brands can expand and how they can do so in the regulatory framework. Can you maybe speak to how brands can think about uh, scaling and, and managing their IP issues as well as any international uh, rumblings that we're hearing from our, our neighbors down south? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Evan. So uh, as Evan knows, I'm an IP lawyer. Uh, and so cannabis and IP is really a passion of mine where those two meet. Um, uh, lots of rumblings from down in Mexico. We're working with a number of partner law firms down there. And the message is basically, you know, pump the brakes, not so fast. Not that legalization is not coming, but for particularly for cannabis beverages, um, it, it's likely going to be look a lot more like Canada, where you had uh, legalization at the national level, and then you know what they called cannabis 2.0 edibles and beverages came later. Actually, I think in Canada it was only December of 2019, so a little over a year ago. Uh, I think things are going to go pretty slowly in Mexico, and at least the folks we're talking with, the legislation is still not final. Uh, beverages might not be allowed right away in Mexico. In the U.S., I think the, the top line story really is the consequences, uh, the myriad consequences, really, of federal prohibition on, you know, our great cannabis brand's ability to expand. Um, one major problem that we encounter frequently in our practice, Evan, is the lack of uh, the ability to get federal trademark protection for these great brands. Um, and the need to uh, try to protect the brand on a, on a state by state basis. Uh, that's a real challenge as you try to build brands of national scope, right? And, um, and of course, uh, uh, we're seeing uh, uh, an increasing number of, of litigation matters where uh, non cannabis brands are taking advantage of the handicap that cannabis brands have and, and bringing lawsuits against them uh, for using the mark. So, to make it a, a concrete example, uh, you know, you can build the, the, the leading cannabis beverages brand, uh, one of at least can from what we saw um, in the headset report, uh, client of ours, uh, great product, you know, trajectory uh, off the charts. Um, but some non-cannabis company could come in and try to make them change the name because they can't get federal trademark protection given prohibition. That's a direct consequence of, of prohibition at the federal level. So that's one really big problem to expanding your brand. And the second is, um, 
is really the inability of a, of a cannabis brand to expand cross state, cross border, the way any other consumer product uh, company could, which is to say, ship your products from where you manufacture them into another state. So uh, I'm sure many people in attendance here are familiar with the process of, of going into that other state and trying to find a trusted partner to manufacture and, and sell and distribute your products. Lots of companies have been very successful at it. Uh, we handled the transaction for CAN, uh, not the recent Green Thumb transaction, but we helped them expand into Nevada. You gotta find a really trusted partner and then you have to exercise that control over your brand working with that partner. Other consumer product companies don't have that challenge necessarily. They have the option of expanding themselves into multiple states or entering into a partnership agreement. So there's some real challenges and, and, I, and I really think they all, most of them all flow from federal prohibition. Maybe one day we'll, we'll see that change. We, we definitely hope so. Uh, so with that, and, and I know we're running close in time, I'll give everyone a, a couple of last uh, parting words. Um, you know, Tracy, you, you started with your packaging, you put out a, a beautiful brand, beautiful packaging, a lot of extra cost. And, you know, we have these challenges of expansion. Where do you see the horizon for regulatory reform, at the very least in California, and your thoughts about how you want to move that forward for your brand in, in particular? Well, I do see some relief coming relative to the packaging restrictions that we're seeing because I know that, you know, that we're, we're very close with certain legislatures, uh, slow legislators um, to get that change. So that will give us a little bit relief from a cost of goods point of view and allow us a little bit more, ne more money in, reser in, uh, in reserved earnings that we can apply to expansion in other states. Um, we're really hopeful about expanding into, into Canada. Um, for obvious reasons, not just to show the uh, show the global applicability of what it is that we're doing um, by using the same methodology that we have to use um, by moving from state to state, which would be essentially shipping them our unmedicated raws and working with them uh, to develop the right uh, types of um, right types of emulsions that work with our raw materials. So, um, in many ways, we're looking at partners like Vertosa, with whom we've partnered very closely in creating uh, very specific emulsions that marry to the flavor and uh, I mean, may, uh, to, the, to the tannic com compounds that are exist in wine that, are, that don't exist in water. So it's a much more complicated process. So, you know, if Vertos is going to Jersey, we're going to Jersey. <laughs> if Vertos is in Canada, we're following them to, to Canada. And that's really just an easy, it, you know, that's not just about having good corporate relations, but it's also about being smart about how to execute more quickly than you would by having to establish a new partner in a particular region, because that is, as we can create all of the product without Vertosa's influence, but unless they're there to give us the right emulsion that's gonna be stable and have the right, right flavor compounds that marry to the high, high level of quality that we're looking for, uh, there's no point in doing it. So um, basically we partner with, with the people that make our brand go and uh, we're moving forward in that direction. Great, thank you. So you are close on time, but Austin, I want to give you a final word to, to round out the panel. And certainly for all the, the viewers in the audience, you have some experts here that are willing to answer questions and help you get beverages to market. Uh, with that said, Austin, some, some final words on policy and regulations. I appreciate that, Evan. I appreciate the entire panel. Uh, no, firstly, just my gratitude to, to Tracy uh, on the House of Saco brand um, for the compliments um, and to, to Brett for acknowledging you know, a lot of the hurdles um, that it does take to create a consistent product experience across um, you know, state lines and across country lines. Um, you know, this is a labor of love by each and every one of us um, here on this panel. Uh, we do it because we believe in cannabis beverage. We do it uh, because we know that this form factor is familiar, it's approachable and one that is scalable, uh, but it only is scalable uh, with supportive uh, regulations uh, and supply chains. Um, so, you know, for my final words is for those and all those that are consumers today, you know, go to your dispensaries, ask for beverages, demand for beverages, um, go to your policymakers, ask for supportive legislation um, for cannabis beverages, um, ask for supportive legislation uh, to create an investment environment um, that allows to develop greater supply chain partners. Right now it's expensive. Uh, it's very hard to go into a new state and to set up a beverage manufacturing line. 
Um, and there's a lot of hurdles that you've got to go through. And there's a lot of existing co-manufacturers out there that could do a great job with more supportive uh, state level legislation. Um, so it really does take advocacy. It takes uh, demand and it comes from the consumer uh, first uh, and the operator is gonna be there to support you with awesome, awesome products. Um, like the ones that, that Tracy has at House Osaka uh, and the ones um, that Headset mentioned uh, earlier in this call. Um, so I thank you all and you know, just, just go get an infused beverage and, and keep asking for more. Well, thank you all the panelists for your, your thoughts uh, here. And again, if, uh, if anyone in the audience has additional questions, please let us know and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them either on this conversation more likely after the fact as well. So Brett, Tracy, Austin, thank you all again. Um, and for our, yeah, definitely raise a toast to the, the infused beverage. And um, for our next panel, uh, right before that, we are going to jump into a polling question to ask the audience, what have you all consumed as an infused beverage product? So we'll, we'll throw that up on screen as we're transitioning to our next panel, which is building cannabis beverage brands. Um, and we got some interesting results here. Most of us have tried sparkling water and seltzer primarily. Uh, tea is the second leading category and then beer and cider. So some really interesting uh, statistics there that we're getting from, from our group. So, well, without further ado, I'd like to, to call up Warren Bobrow as the host for the next panel. Joining him, Angela Pai and Debbie Novograd. And I will let uh, Warren take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Evan, Evan thank you very, very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we were going to have uh, Chris on the phone from uh, Kaliva. There was a family emergency, so he can't be here. Um, so I, ha I have some interesting people. I have Angela Pai and I have uh, Debbie Novograd. And I'm really hoping that I have a chance to let everyone give their elevator pitch. What are they doing <laughs> in the business? So uh, there you have it. Uh, let's start with Angela. Tell me, what is your passion? Who are you? Oh my God, I live to build brands. So I'm, I'm actually uh, wearing one of our uh, newest brands, which will come to market in May. Um, so, you know, we'll wait to talk about that in a moment, but I've been in marketing for 25 years. I'm uh, here at Cannacraft as the chief marketing officer. Really lucky to be able to have the number two and number three brand with Hi-Fi. And uh, also in terms of Keith, I got to kind of keep it close to myself. Yeah, you got to keep the other one disappears. And, you know, it, know. it does play it's, into cannabis. Am I seeing it all correctly? But, you know, it's beautiful <laughs> stuff. Yeah. So we have Hi-Fi Hops and Keith, which is a number two and number three. I mean, obviously, it's great to see uh, a brand like Can do so well because that says a lot about consumer interest, consumer behavior with micro microdose beverage. So I think that's great for everyone. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you test your own products? I test all our products. <laughs> <laughs> are there tasting notes for them? Uh, there are. We, we do quite an extensive R&D whenever we go into testing. Um, I've tasted every single microdose beverage in the market in California uh, as we are about to launch Gem and Jane. So uh, it's great to be able to see uh, what other brands are doing, the flavor profiles, how it makes you feel. Um, and a lot of what Tracy and, and Austin was seeing about the quality, consistency, and potency, just making sure that we are delivering a really great consistent product and a really great effect in terms of how they're gonna experience it. And, and it's delicious, right? Uh, yeah, you really need, really need to try this elderflower pear. <laughs> that sounds great, that sounds great. Debbie, welcome. Are you gonna uh, you. Give a, tell us who you are and about your fabulous background? I, I know that uh, you're pretty famous and uh, <laughs> it's really an honor to be here and sit on the same virtual stage. So thank uh, you, well. Elevator pitch. All right, elevator pitch. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure I live up to that, but I'll take it. Um, I, uh, I come from a, a group of companies at the, at the current moment. Um, Advanced Beverage Technologies is our umbrella and BevZero is one of our companies, which is really the key focus here today. Um, BevZero is really a company that um, 
has gotten into the industry as a means of helping clients kind of go from um, ideation all the way through execution. So um, stepping back one, um, Advanced Beverage Technologies holds three companies, all really in the adult beverage space in different ways. Um, BevZero is that consulting advisory arm that helps with everything from product development um, to advising uh, with, with key partners and, and helping our customers get to execution in low alcohol, no alcohol, and then no alcohol infused beverages, which is why we're here. Um, we have a, a company that is the service side called um, Contech, and that really helps to scale up all of those innovative products. So large scale dealkalization, filtration, um, things that a beverage that either does or may have had alcohol may need. Um, and then last but not least, a group called ABT&E that um, holds some uh, equipment distribution for the purpose of this conversation. Again, uh, technology that dealkalizes, all important with uh, infused beverages. So that said, um, my background, which is probably part of your reference, um, yeah. is uh, having worked with Starbucks during some very high growth years and an amazing experience as one would expect. Um, you know, I was really in brand building and um, market and category development, both national and international, and was with them at a time where, you know, whoever would think Starbucks felt like a small company, but it did. Um, and they were growing at that time from roughly 1,500 stores, North America plus one country, all the way up to 10,000 stores, 27 countries, you know, and beyond, including some fun products I got to work on, things like matcha frappuccino and, um, and uh, jelly tea, which here would be called bubble tea. I'm not sure if it's still there. But, uh, but yeah, some great experience, both in branding and execution, um, certainly in food and beverage. Um, and that's really kind of brought me here from the cannabis perspective, really getting involved over the past couple of years through BevZero, um, which was an arm we launched specifically to get into cannabis uh, and working with an exceptional team. Um, you know, our team has everything from winemakers to brewers to distillers, um, food scientists that are there to kind of help through the process because it is a complicated process. Um, and then, you know, most recently having the privilege and luxury to work with some key partners, many who are on this, uh, this presentation here, this group call um, to launch, um, to help launch, I should say what Evan was holding, um, the non-infused low dose um, cider or the infused non-alcoholic low dose cider Harmony Beverages Malice product. So that's my background. Um, it's been a fun ride um, and uh, it continues to be a fun ride. When I was at Starbucks, I think I never would have guessed I'd be helping with cannabis products, but uh, fun to be here nonetheless. That's great. That, that gives me more of a background. You know, I, I came out of the corporate world, but it was the corporate world of, of liquor and uh, transitioning into, into the uh, mixology side of the, of the cannabis infused beverage business is really exciting within the context that I'm hoping that people drink less, Yeah, but I want them to have fun too. And I want them to know that this is strictly for, ad for adults. This is what I do is not for kids. Mm -hmm. And I believe what you do is not for kids. And I know what Angela does is not for kids either. This is right. white tablecloth, top of the house, the best things that money can buy. And we want to give it to someone who wants something that's not, you know, sweet candy flavored seltzers or whatever, but, but it's something that, that should, you know, bear in mind. Anyway, getting back to this, uh, Angela, why THC? Why, why CBD? Uh, can we go back to, to Angela on this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, to, to, uh, to kind of like take a step back, I mean, obviously with, for, for Hi-Fi Hops and for Keef, you know, these have CBD uh, and THC and Keef is 100 milligrams THC, but also, you know, with other brands that we're, we're about to launch, we're actually focusing on rare cannabinoids. So the Delta-8 THC and also THCV, these mm -hmm. actually give you a, a softer high, so to speak. And then also at less than five milligrams, you can drink several of them. So you're not really getting hit with just one of, uh, of these servings. You're actually going to be able to enjoy it like a glass of wine and, and have that sort of um, take the edge off type, type of feeling. Yeah, you know, I, I judge the uh, High Times uh, 
cannabis infused beverages thing that just just you know wrapped up recently and i taste a lot of of the beverages that i may not necessarily have been able to taste and i was really impressed by the fact that they were not candy but they also had you know these were thc beverages as opposed to cbd beverages so i have to say that it's so important to differentiate between the two because if i look at a bottle and i see that it has cbd and thc i'm wondering why <laughs> so i put that to you why you know do your beverages they're thc or cbd or a combination of the two and why do people do that Sure. Uh, when you have a combination of CBD and THC, it really does activate more of an entourage effect where you need the CB1, CB2 receptors to be able to actually have the THC activate with the CBD opening up that key. So, you know, to really fully experience it, having a balance of both uh, cannabinoids really do help. Debbie, I'm going to put the same question to you. Why THC? Why THC over CBD? That's a tough you question know, for you because you know you come out of traditional beverages and people lost their jobs for smoking weed. So, <laughs> true. and you know Very what I'm true. talking about. I I worked yeah. in banking. I know. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I would say for us, really, when we're working with a, um, a product or a customer, we're more driven in the development work we're doing based on um, the customer's um, desire. But I will say the THC or CBD um, and what um, what product they're hoping to develop in the long run um, is ultimately up to them um, and the partners that we work with, Sobertosa or whoever is helping to guide them on that. Um, that said, I think more and more we're seeing, um, just as Angela said, sort of that combination. Um, and those are the products that are that are really being uh, desired in market. And we've you know we've seen a heavier push initially in THC, I'm sure, because people weren't in understanding or the ability to get the CBD out there. Um, and now that blending option um, has been something people are moving towards. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the beginnings. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with you just for a second. I know because I'm developing a, a brand right now and it's uh, really, really hard, hardest thing I've ever done. And I've done a lot of things and failed at a lot of things. <laughs> How do you develop a brand? How do you develop a, a beverage brand in the cannabis space these days? What, I mean, they brought you in to do something, but how is it done? It's a tough thing, isn't it? Angela or me? Oh, <laughs> sorry. You, 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 you. Okay, okay, I'm yes, sorry. it is I'm a sorry, tough Debbie. thing. I said, uh, no, that's with okay. You for a second, and then we'll no, no, go no, back that's to Angela. Okay. Um, it is a tough thing. Um, it is not a traditional beverage development. Um, you know, not that that's easy by any means, uh, but this certainly has a lot more complexities to it. So yes, do you have to go through all the same steps as you would in a beverage development? Absolutely. You know, what is your concept? Who's the market? You know, who's your target audience? What's the need in the market? Um, what's the product? Um, yes, you have to go through all of that. You have to as well, obviously go through multiple steps in order to do formulation. It's not a simple, um, you know, what is my base beverage for a wine? What is my wine, right? And I'm gonna put it in the bottle and, and market it. And um, But you have to, especially in the products we work with a lot, which are dealkalized beverages, you know, you are finding your base beverage that will work best with the product that you're hoping to achieve in the long run. And when I say that, that means THC or CBD or a combination, the type of emulsion that you're looking for. It can as well mean, where do you want to sell your product? What type of label do you need? Does it need to be a clean product with clean ingredients? Can you use, um, you know, can you use different preservatives or not? If you want to sell this product eventually in a Whole Foods, the answer is not. Um, and so some of those things are very critical and they all um, go into the upfront development but one of the things I think that we have found, and as we have moved with a lot of our customers, you know, first really thinking we could help them innovate that product, and then they could take care of any everything else, um, that quickly became a non-option because there was so much more that was involved in creating that product um, that we needed to know everything along the line, including the types of emulsions that work better with different products, um, the types of um, labeling, packaging, 
um, like I said, stabilizers, preservatives. Um, you also needed to know, which came as a big aha, and I think anyone in this space who has done a beverage now recognizes, you need to know early on where you're going to be co-packing your beverage um, because that has critical implications. If you can do it yourself and you have your own facility, fantastic. Most of us don't. Um, and so it has huge implications on the development process. So versus developing and having to redevelop, the identification of a co-packer and understanding their capabilities um, is critical. And, and some of the key areas that that uh, plays a major effect is in, you know, certain things like how can they mix? Can they do batch mixing or are they doing individual dosing? That's going to play a factor on what kind of emulsions you're using. Um, what kind of packaging can they do? Are they cans? Are they bottles? What's the size? What's the closures? Um, you know, that's a critical aspect. And the kind of packaging is going to sometimes determine where you can sell it and what kind of product can go in it. So you need to know that upfront. Um, stability. Stability is obviously a critical aspect, um, not only of a beverage, not only of a non-alcoholic beverage, but an infused non-alcoholic or other infused beverage is critical too. You know, is your active ingredient going to fall out? Um, have you tested it? Is the emulsion and active ingredient you've chosen work well with your base product? Um, and does your co-packer have the ability to stabilize it in the means you want it? Can they do pasteurization? Do they have filtration? Um, can they do refriger under refrigeration? Um, are they willing to use, or are you willing to use different preservatives or Velcron or other types of stabilizers? So, um, you know, and then last but not least, I would also add with that co-packer in mind, you know, based on the kind of product you're going to produce, is there an oxidation issue? So certain products are very susceptible to oxygen. And so if you have that type of product, and a lot of the products we do are like that, you know, can your co-packer or does your co-packer have the equipment they need, the processes in place, the tools to ensure, um, you know, the, the oxygen pickup isn't there. And all of those go back into the stability aspect. So making an infused beverage um, is yes, follows the path of a typical beverage. You gotta do all those things but you have to know upfront some of the things you wouldn't think about until typically the end, so that when you're producing it and when you're developing it, you have given all of that um, thought in the process. That's great. Angela, I, I didn't want you to feel like I'd forgotten you. Oh, but, no, not uh, at all. But I, but um, I, but I, but I, I'm sorry, but I just, want, I, I just want to know how you got to have that beautiful can and what <laughs> went into it to making it taste better and than anything else on the market what what is it that you do that is so effective to make you the the best person to do what you do well if i have to that, put that product forward sure if i have to put it on one thing um i'm very lucky and fortunate to be working for a large cannabis company like Canacraft. We have our own R&D team. We have our own, um, we, we have our own uh, canning line. We have our own bottling line. We have the flexibility to actually take our own time and develop from within uh, all of the recipes and, and all of the formulations. So, you know, I, I think that's really a huge advantage to be able to take the time with formulation to do the research. To, and ultimately, I think from a marketing standpoint, in terms of successful brands are, do you understand the target audience? What's their behavior? What are, what are their activities? How, um, how effective are we as marketers in changing behavior? Because a lot of people think, oh, marketing is good. It's about generating awareness and getting people to know about you. That's just only like the tip of the spear. The most important thing is, have we as marketers successfully changed or affect a behavior? And in order to do that, you really need to understand your consumer or your target consumer really, really well. That's, that's really crisp and, and also very granular. And it taught me something that, uh, that, leaded, that sort of led me into the next question um, about the, uh, do smaller mom and pop shops have a chance against the major companies? So I'm gonna leave this with you again, Angela. And that's my segue. You work in a big company. 
do you think us small companies have a chance against you? Maybe not against you, but but it's just we don't have the resources that you have. So therefore, therefore, build a really effective, smart team. It doesn't have to be a big team, but they really need to know what they're doing so that you can be efficient and um, you can be mindful of where your resources are going and do your homework, do your research so that you're not wasting a lot of time learning along the way. Um, one of the things I love about the cannabis industry is that it is very nascent and it's very forgiving, but you have to always try to do the right thing and always want to keep trying what's going to be new, what's going to work and what's not going to work. Yeah, you know, uh, it's it's really interesting when I think about why cannabis beverages and I wrote the book Cannabis Cocktails, Mocktails and Tonics back in 2015 and no one had heard these things before and they were really scared of them, quite frankly, because People, many people have had bad experiences with edibles, so they thought immediately, you know, eating the entire chocolate bar was going to be the same thing as drinking a cannabis beverage, and it really isn't. And the, the other part of it, which I think is so important here, is it's really non-confrontational. When someone goes out and smokes a joint every, in public, everyone knows your business, and everyone knows mm -hmm. immediately, and because of stigmas, and having grown up in New Jersey, I'll tell you clearly that drinking a cannabis beverage was a non-starter when I was growing up. But now, you know, with legalization here in New Jersey, it's something that's really, really exciting. And we we would love it because no one knows your business when you're drinking a cannabis beverage. And that's really important in a social stratum. And I know that you make that conscious decision in business. You know, you may not want to go out and smoke a joint with yeah. your boss, but if you're sipping on a cannabis beverage, no one's going to ask you any questions about that. So no, absolutely. And, and that leads on to your overall product design and your package design, right? And oh, absolutely. We, took that, we took that into um, into mind as we were designing, well, naming the brand and then, you know, creating creating packaging that looks so pretty. And uh, especially since this is a, uh, a cannabis beverage created for women by women, we have an all female team who've worked on the R&D design and the, and the branding of this, that you know, uh, uh, the, the consumer is gonna be able to hold this and mm -hmm. not feel like they're, they're having some sort of old school type of weedy type of beverage. It's, gonna, it's, it's actually a lifestyle brand that we're, we're creating. That's true. So um, let's go back to, for a second to you, Debbie. Um, let's talk about you know, a, a different thing. What kind of strategies do, do you use? And I'm gonna turn this back to Debbie for a second. So I'm seeing you, Angela, in my, my camera. Um, Debbie, I'm going to ask you, what are the strategies for branding that are working? Yeah, no, great okay. question. Um, and I think, you know, Angela hit on a key point too, which is know your target um, because that's obviously going to come to play in your branding. And I say that because, you know, I think especially in the cannabis beverage space, there are a myriad of different targets. Um, there is your microdose target, there is your high dose target, um, and there's something in between. But know your target because I think, as you know, exactly what Angel said, which is um, everything from your packaging design, your naming, your flavor profiles, all of that needs to be developed with that in mind um, because, because cannabis is where it is. And while everyone is aware and interested in trying a beverage, the awareness of different beverage brands are very hard to move forward. Um, you know, marketing is not easy. Communications around it is not easy. Um, so you need to identify your target, speak to them, speak to them in the social that they use, speak to them in the way that they use it, design it in the way that they use it. Um, and I think that is one of the most critical points from a branding perspective. Um, and I think it is also where it is wide open for those mom and pops to your previous question too, which is before the national brands begin to play, now is your time. Um, now is your time to do it, to get it right, make a name for yourself. And once you are in market, you have the ability to either stay because now you have a brand following or as most people would like to get bought up by the big guys once they're ready to go. So, you know, don't shy away, 
But I think to, you know, part of this conversation is find your partners. You know, if there's nothing else I've learned over the years, it's know what you know and know what you don't know um, and find the people who know what you don't know because they are going to help you. And, you know, it is a bit forgiving right now because you can start small. You can start with a smaller budget and you can start small. So if you make a mistake, circle back and fix it. So to, to loop back to your question on branding, I think, you know, is it branding 101? you know, know who you're speaking to and speak to them and speak to them consistently and fix it if something goes wrong, because your loyalty is going to come in meeting their needs um, and delivering upon it. And I think the cannabis beverage consumer, again, especially in the low dose and the micro dose, um, is the consumer who is looking to build a relationship with their brand. Um, and they are looking to have something that may feel healthful, may feel you know, interesting, have a good story behind it. So it is a wide open door for those who have a passion and have an interest in creating a product now um, and not waiting, quite honestly. Um, so, you know, th that's my feedback from a branding perspective, perspective and from a strategy as well. Um, you know, any customer that walks in our door, if they haven't first figured out their, their target audience, that's step number one. And they really need to go back and figure that out before we can begin any development or any introductions to the partners they're going to need along the way. Cool. Angela, I love those cans and I'm really jealous because they remind me of the ones that I wanted, but I didn't get. So uh, <laughs> tell me about uh, how you effectively differentiate your brand, Angela. Well, we're going to be going to market pretty soon. Um, and the branding in itself, just being uh, very much a lifestyle feel, um, the product development in terms of flavor profiles, uh, you know, really great, sophisticated botanical palettes, like you know the, the elderflower pear, like I talked about, or the yuzu raspberry rose, or the strawberry hibiscus. These are sophisticated flavors. And, um, and also with the rare cannabinoids that we're bringing in. But, not not just the the branding and the and the way it looks, but you know to really be able to stand out from a really fast moving brand like Can, to to look at what's going to be your sampling program, what's going to be your VIP program, what are we going to be able to negotiate at the store level to be able to own that cooler? I think for us again, it's great that we have the second and third brand right now in beverages to be able to own that cooler to get the placement. So this is still marketing and sales 101 in terms of going out there, getting your shelf space, getting the presence, and more importantly, the education. Um, being able to educate the bud tenders, the buyers, and on social to educate the potential consumers on what are rare cannabinoids, you know, what are some of the effects with THCV, which are then thought of as maybe doesn't give you the munchies, although we can't really say that legally. But, uh, yeah, you're not going to want to eat that pizza afterwards. So, um, or you're going to have a great workout uh, after uh, one or two of the THCV beverages. So, being able to talk about those effects, playing into the consumer lifestyle, is also part of the brand experience. And and those, but the design, design plays into so much. I'm lucky that I have incredible design. This this is beautiful. And as I said, uh, I'm really happy to see you using that European slender can because real thought went into that. It and does. And also because we're looking at it from a standpoint of we're celebrating how women are multifaceted. They're, they, they're like a story or a narrative. We designed packaging that made it look like a book cover. So something to discover. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's really nice stuff. Debbie, um, let's go back to you just for a second. Uh, in the time that we have left, which is pretty short. What is, uh, what is the biggest hurdle that, that you face? So if, if someone was going to say to you, what is standing in your way? It, it, it may be legalization. It may be other stuff. So in your company, what, what's the tough things that, that you face? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I do think, you know, legalization regulatory is something we all face, um, you know, because for us uh, and our customers that we work with, you know, the goal is obviously to create a great product, um, get that product on the shelf and have it sell. Um, 
the ability to scale up and have the distribution system to allow scale up is a big hurdle. Um, and I say that because that affects everything from the, the product, from the cost of the product, um, from you know the, the ability to reduce those costs, find investors. Um, and so I, you know, I think for everybody here, that is the hurdle. Although, as I said, it, it does present unique opportunities um, for those to be able to get started in a small way and build their brand slowly, um, where sometimes it needs to be built that way. But, you know, I, I'm not sure anyone who would point to anything else that, you know, other than the regulatory environment um, for the hurdles that are out there. Um, yeah, that's good. Angela, can we go back to you for a second and talk about those, those hurdles? I, I, I know that we've been talking about the blockages and I, I think it's really important to understand that this is something new. I mean, the, the rules haven't all been written yet. Here in New Jersey, they're, they're, put, they're lumping everything under edibles, which I think is a great mistake. And it's a, uh, you know, so what type of things can you share with us, Angela? Oh, in terms of uh, challenges? Terms of blo blo blockages, like, you know, barriers. Um, I think consistency, you know, everybody uh, with cannabis, it's a very personal journey. So how you react to five milligrams and how I react to five milligrams might be very different. Yeah. Right. And uh, I know a hundred milligram uh, beverage will probably help me hibernate. Um, and yeah, so sure. you'll, you'll be a New York Times article. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, the most challenging thing is to try and create a consistent uh, a consistent effect a consistent um, behavior in terms of how am I going to feel how is each consumer going to feel after a four milligram uh, beverage and that you know we can encourage her or him them to be able to have two or three so that predictable consistency I think is something that's really important when people especially in the microdose segment are coming in as cannabis newbies to make sure they don't have a bad experience to begin with yeah so so what I want to lead into the two words that we were missing in liquor common sense and you don't have to drink all the all the beverages in that four pack you can have one Wait an hour, see how you feel. As you said very clearly, Angela, what affects you may not affect me. What affects Debbie may not affect the person down the hall. And then the other person is destroyed. And that that has to be taken into effect. So we always say common sense. Um, I think we've said we've come through a lot of stuff and uh, and really tried to become a, a little more in, you know, knowledgeable about this. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. I wash dishes. So uh, this, you know, putting together a, a brand and, you know, I consider myself the luckiest guy in the world, but uh, to be in your company, both you and Debbie, and, you know, th that's like a dream come true. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Such a privilege thank to you. be on this panel. Yep, it was great. Thank you very much. Appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank you all very much, Warren, uh, Angela, and Debbie. Really informative panel on building a brand and, and some of the challenges you've had, but also some of the excitement that you're bringing to market. I mean, you know, recognizing that women do have a higher index in the beverage space in cannabis, there, there are many reasons for that, uh, is really exciting because now we have a platform to build brands that speak to a very particular audience, one that uh, ideally would have a much larger voice in the cannabis industry, but unfortunately over the past couple of years that, that has not been the case. So excited to see you guys launching a, a female led brand. And I know there are many others that, that will come down the, the pipeline as well. So thank you all for your time uh, this afternoon and evening. Uh, really appreciate your thoughts on cannabis beverages and, and looking forward to the next event with you guys as well. So thank you. And, and with that, uh, we, I believe we have one more polling question that we're going to put out there right now. Uh, this will be more around the, the space that you feel is the future of cannabis, where we're talking about beverages now. Uh, we'll put the polling question up for the next uh, large market in cannabis. So we, we have a few topics here uh, for consumption, and we'll see what comes back in with the poll. But clearly, uh, beverages as a category is an exciting one. 
As I mentioned earlier, the fight now is for share of buzz, uh, which, you know, buzz can take a lot of different meanings, but an infused beverage, whether it be THC, uh, Delta-8, CBD, all of the above, these are really where they're exciting um, entry points to the cannabis space. And what I would like to do is also bring back onto the virtual stage, um, Josh, who is the leader of Canada Gather and has been helping to spearhead this exceptional community now for I believe the last seven years. I, I don't know if it's six years or seven years since, since we met. Um, so thank you again for continuing to build the Canada Gather community and allowing us for talk today about the future of cannabis beverages. So Josh, I will turn it back over to you. Yeah, thanks again, Evan and Jim, for uh, putting together an, an incredible presentation, uh, comprehensive, uh, interesting, data-driven. Um, great to see guys like Austin, who I've known for years, even before Bertosa, uh, launching the next generation of, of uh, cannabis industry. So um, we're really at an inflection point, uh, and this particular segment apparently is, is on fire, uh, attracting the likes of talent like like Debbie, who I, I wasn't previously familiar with, who came from you know Starbucks, which is you know when it, when it comes to beverages, I think that you know they're they're pretty well known. Um, so so thanks again, Evan. Thanks again, Jim. Um, it's been great to see a lot of you uh, in the chat. Uh, Gaetano, Jared, Dr. Uma. Um, thank you, Tamika, as well for for producing this. Um, Thomas Larosa, who's been our our longest standing Canna Gather uh, team member and has been our point person on beverages. Saw him in the chat. Um, so it's, it's great to be with all of you again and hopefully we'll, we'll be together again in person. Um, curious, definitely hit me up. Uh, my hair got really long uh, over, uh, over this past like quarantine time. I'm not sure how long I'm gonna let it go, but you know, hit me up with what you've been up to over the past uh, 12 months. Uh, as Evan said, I've been doing this for uh, seven years uh, next month. Um, so things have changed a lot. And things are going to keep changing. Um, so uh, be sure to check out the next one. It's going to be on 422, uh, 422, uh, April 22nd, Earth Day, uh, talking about sustainability, the intersection of sustainability and, and cannabis and the cannabis industry. So that should be a, a really fascinating uh, topic for multi bottom line opportunities. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. We had, we had over 100 people throughout the entire, uh, entire broadcast. And yeah, next one's going to be Earth Day, as Jim said. Uh, and keep me posted with, thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Uh, my pseudo relative, uh, Gary Weinstein. So yeah, if, uh, if you're, if you're interested, feel free to hit me up. Uh, hopefully I can be of help in some way, uh, route it to the right person or place or thing. Uh, Joy posted the, the link, cannagather.com slash virtual events slash April 2021. Uh, thank you to Brett from Goodwin for sponsoring. Um, you know, one of the top law firms, uh, in, uh, in, in the world really. So, um, you know, that's a huge honor. And, uh, if you're interested in getting involved as a future speaker sponsor, um, or collaborator in some fashion as a team member to help spread the word about can together as we kick things back off, uh, at least virtually to start, uh, definitely let me know, josh at cannagather.com, uh, jim at cannagather.com for, for Jim Bogdino. Uh, 